Diagnostic considerations in the diagnosis and management of primary biliary cholangitis, as it's called now, uh, are important to keep in mind. There is a spectrum of autoimmune liver diseases that may range from autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, primary sclerosing cholangitis, and IgG4 positive disease or IgG4 related autoimmune cholangitis and pancreatitis. It's important for the clinician to keep in mind the differential diagnosis for patients with cholestatic liver biochemical test abnormalities because there is a substantial number of conditions that can masquerade as PBC. These include drug-induced liver injury, inherited cholestasis, idiopathic ductopenic disorders, malignant infiltration, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, primary biliary cholangitis, primary sclerosing cholangitis, or sarcoid liver disease. Important to keep in mind the diagnostic markers in PBC. PBC is a common adult autoimmune liver disease, uh, but still overall quite uncommon, and some would consider this a rare disorder in comparison to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or viral hepatitis. The overwhelming majority of patients are women in middle age who have circulating antimitochondrial antibodies. Cholestasis is usually presented and reflected as a predominant rise in serum alkaline phosphatase values. And at presentation, most patients are largely asymptomatic. Over time, however, symptoms such as pruritus and fatigue are recognized to be associated with a significant impact on quality of life. PBC phenotype generally is associated with age greater than 45 years. There is a strong female to male predominance of nine to one. The serologic tests that are abnormal are a positive anti-mitochondrial antibody in about 95% of patients and a disease-specific anti-nuclear antibody in about 30 to 50% of patients. The anti-smooth muscle antibody or anti-actin antibody may also be frequently present. Serum immunoglobulin M values are typically elevated. However, MRCP by definition, is normal as this is a disorder of the small interlobular bile ducts, generally smaller than 80 microns in size, and therefore the large bile ducts seen on cholangiography should be normal. Liver histology may be characteristic in this condition with a lymphocytic infiltrate, potentially florid bile duct lesions, which are intense aggregates of lymphocytes around bile ducts, and there may be variable numbers of non-caseating granulomata. It is generally important to keep in mind that a patient with coexisting IBD or inflammatory bowel disease is more likely to have PSC, primary sclerosing cholangitis, as opposed to primary biliary cirrhosis, and in PSC, the anti-mitochondrial antibody is generally negative. Symptom burden is important to characterize with regard to pruritus, fatigue, sicka syndrome, dry eyes, mouth, abdominal pain, arthralgias may be present, but some patients may remain asymptomatic. Therefore, it is important to take a relevant medical history, important to seek other causes of autoimmune diseases, and seek the presence of recurrent urinary tract infections, pruritus during pregnancy, et cetera. The interpretation of the AMA, the ANA, and the immunoglobulin testing in PBC is important to keep in mind in that 90% of patients have a positive anti-mitochondrial antibody. The anti-nuclear antibody may be present in two immunofluorescent patterns that are specific to PBC. There may be multiple nuclear dots and perinuclear rim-like or membranous spots. Automated ANA assays will likely not detect 
these reactivities. Laboratories should perform immunofluorescence if ELISA-based assays for the GP210 and SB100 antibody are not available. IgM is the most sensitive immunoglobulin that is elevated in PBC, but it is not specific to PBC. And it is important to remember that the elevated IgG globulin or gamma globulin fraction is primarily observed in autoimmune hepatitis. It's important to keep in mind that there could be a variety of overlap or crossover scenarios. And these have been defined as immunoserological overlap. That is a patient that has an autoantibody profile that could be more suggestive of autoimmune hepatitis versus PBC or both. For example, in autoimmune hepatitis, the anti-smooth muscle antibody and the anti-nuclear antibody are positive, and there are elevated IgG globulins. But sometimes you see that in a patient with PBC. Similarly, you can see a patient with autoimmune hepatitis who has a positive anti-mitochondrial antibody. You may see biochemical overlap. Generally in PBC, you have a predominant elevation of the alkaline phosphatase out of proportion to the ALT and the AST. But occasionally you see patients with autoimmune hepatitis who have a cholestatic profile characterized by an elevated alkaline phosphatase. And occasionally in patients with PBC, there may be an elevation of liver enzymes, ALT, AST, but not alkaline phosphatase. There is radiologic overlap. This doesn't apply so much to PBC, but many patients with autoimmune hepatitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis may have overlapping features. And then there is histologic overlap, which is frequently uh, a problem for clinicians because in patients with PBC, there often is some interface hepatitis, low levels of piecemeal necrosis that raise the question of an overlap syndrome. The key point to take away is the use of alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin values in determining prognosis. This slide shows that among patients with PBC who maintain an elevated alkaline phosphatase and an elevated bilirubin, the 15-year survival is significantly reduced compared to patients who have an alkaline phosphatase less than twice the upper limit of normal with a normal bilirubin. And that difference in survival can range from 24 to 79%. So it's important for clinicians to be able to recognize changes in alkaline phosphatase and of course bilirubin for patients who have been on ursodeoxycholic acid for a period of time and determine those who might be in need of additional therapies. Now, I mentioned the GP210 antibody. Uh, this is a very interesting discovery that showed that patients who have this particular PBC-specific antinuclear antibody have much higher rates of aggressive disease and have a significantly higher rate of mortality compared to patients who have the anti-GP210 antibody and some have advocated that patients with PBC should in fact have these checked routinely. This is a study from Greek and Spanish patients with PBC showing once again much higher rates of much higher alkaline phosphatase levels and bilirubin levels in patients with a positive antibody. So in assessing the patient, it's very important to clarify the patient's symptoms that may or may not be overlapping with PBC. Does the patient have dry eyes or dry mouth? Does the patient have bone disease? Uh, does the patient have pruritus? And if the patient has fatigue, could it be related to chronic liver disease? If you've identified a patient with a cholestatic liver profile and have an elevated alkaline phosphatase and GGT and an ALTA is to less than five times the upper limit of normal, you wanna be thinking about a patient who may have one of these autoimmune liver diseases. By contrast, in a patient who has a hepatocellular profile without a significant elevation of alkaline phosphatase, autoimmune hepatitis should come to mind. It's also important to keep in mind that drug-induced liver disease may frequently mimic any of these autoimmune conditions, and so it is important to evaluate the drug and supplement history carefully. 
So exclusion of drug-induced liver disease, exclusion of chronic liver diseases, use of cholangiography, and appropriate interpretation of the autoantibody profile are very helpful. So this slide kind of shows in an algorithmic manner how to approach a patient with a positive anti-mitochondrial antibody. A patient that's AMA positive is very likely to have PBC. However, a patient with a cholestatic pattern of lipid liver, liver test abnormalities who is AMA negative has a much larger differential diagnosis. The first step would be to measure the anti-nuclear antibody and to make sure the patient does not have a chronic large duct obstruction disease such as PSC. 